So good evening, everyone. My name is Liza Gentile, and I'm the Director of Alumni Relations here at Johnson & Wales University and a proud alum. Thank you for joining us for tonight's program, Pizza right. Quest, Watch Peter out. Reinhardt's never-ending search for the perfect pizza. <laughs> Peter Stop. will share Stop. stories and photos from his ongoing quest for the perfect pizza. Before we get started, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items. You can keep your cameras on, but please mute your mics. We'd like to keep this session as interactive as possible. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the raise hand feature. We've left time at the conclusion of Peter's presentations for all questions, but if it's pertinent to what's being discussed, feel free to raise your hand and we'll call on you. I'd now like to introduce our presenter, Peter Reinhardt. Peter is the author of 13 books on baking, pizza, and culture. For the past 20 years, he has been the full-time chef on assignment at the Johnson & Wales University campus in Charlotte, North Carolina. He previously taught at the university's Providence campus for four years. He's also the founding director of Johnson & Wales International Symposium on Bread. In January 1996, Peter won the James Beard Foundation's National Bread Competition for his wild yeast. Is anyone at the bread, door? Later featured in his book, Crust and Crumb. He was also the bread chapter author and editor for the revised Joy of Cooking, released in the fall of 1997. For, the two, for two years, he was the creative consultant at Pie Town, Charlotte's first artisan pizzeria, where he introduced a 100% whole grain crust, as well as a number of innovative toppings and products. During the past 20 years, serving as a product consultant, Peter has developed a line of frozen gourmet pizzas, calzones, toaster snacks, bagels, as well as gluten-free products for Amy's Kitchen, the nation's largest producer of organic vegetarian frozen entrees. Peter has addressed and consulted with a number of other companies, including Whole Foods Market, Panera, Great Harvest Bread Company, Marks & Spencer, Tesco, Kellogg's, Kraft Foods, Starbucks, Frito-Lay, Hy-Vee Grocery Company, and Pepperidge Farm. For the past 10 years, he has served as a recurring monthly guest on Charlotte Talks, a daily talk show on the local NPR station in Charlotte. Since December 2010, Peter has been the host and owner of a new video website, pizzaquest.com, where he shares videos, blog entries, and recipes from his never-ending search for the perfect pizza, in which he also explores pizza as a metaphor for the universal search for meaning and self-discovery. His most, most recent book, Pizza Quest, My Never-Ending Search for the Perfect Pizza, was released in April. Peter, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. I will turn it over to you. All right. Well, thank you so much, Liza, and thank you all for, for logging in and joining us tonight. I'm coming to you from Cincinnati, Ohio tonight, where I'm amazingly on another product development project. It's, uh, uh, it's wonderful when these things kind of fall into your lap. The word is out that I like to do this kind of thing, and every once in a while, there's a company that, that uh, likes my ideas, and in fact, uh, I think it's a result of the new book. This, this book, Pizza Quest, the one that just came out, I think I'm seeing it in reverse order, so I don't know how it's looking to you, but I'm seeing it like mirror image. But um, uh, tonight we're going to talk about this book because uh, some of the ideas in there, as well as one that came out last year, and I think the last time I did an alumni event, we were talking about this book, which came out about three years ago, called Perfect Pan Pizza. And these two books together kind of constitute a, a collection of creative ideas for how pizza well, sort of the next generation of where pizza is going and what makes it the most popular food in the world. Um, and I'm going to only go till about 625 and I'm going to stop and open, open the floor to questions and we can talk about anything you want to talk about. But I thought what I would do is take you through um, the new book for those who haven't seen it. And I know some of you have seen it, but uh, I want to take you through the book and um, quickly and sort of just so some highlights and give you some ideas of uh, a, an idea of some of the concepts that have been presented there. And I'll tell you the, the sort of the, the vision behind that book. So I'm gonna share my screen and let me see if I can find it here. Where did it go? Uh, I know I had it on here. Oh, there it is. I think that's it. Uh, and then I got to share here. Let's see if this comes up. Okay, there we go. Okay, so I'm gonna scroll back to um, an earlier part of this book. And um, we'll just kind of go through it quickly. I stop here and that there to show you some some of the highlights. I had it all queued up earlier, and then I 
made the mistake of looking to see how I was looking and let myself in, left myself in the middle. Let's see. So the book, as well, I'm doing this, the book um, is essentially um, a series of tribute recipes, meaning that the concepts are coming from some of the top pizzeria makers or pizzerias in the country, some of the top pizza makers in the country, some are international. Um, and there's 35 recipes in the book, pizza concepts, along with dough recipes and other things. But the, the concepts are not originally mine. They are, here's the sort of, we're back in the front part of the book. Here's the title page. And they, this is an early manuscript version, so it doesn't have the um, the cover shot, but we'll come to that cover shot later. But um, the whole idea of this book, and I'm going to close out this little box here so I can see it more clearly, um, is again, these pizzerias are becoming famous. These are some signature pizzas from these famous pizzerias. And the creators of these pizzas were kind enough to contribute a one or two or even three pizzas. In, in most cases, it's a single pizza. In some cases, two that um, uh, that are ones that you would normally only be able to get at their pizzeria. But they gave me a photo of what we call a beauty shot of the pizza and the basic concept. They did not give me a recipe because we don't really, pizza makers don't really, you know, kind of some of the ingredients are from recipes, but most of the things, it all happens right then and there. It's all mise en place and assembly. But they gave me the concept, and then it was my job to do a homemaker's version of that using my doughs. I didn't want to ask them for any proprietary uh, recipes or, or information, um, just the concept and the photo. And from that, I created 35 versions of their recipes. So I call them tribute recipes, uh, meaning that, I, like the way I describe it is, is that these guys, these pizza makers are like the Beatles of pizza. And I'm like the house band at the Marriott playing their greatest hits. I'm the cover band. And I'm doing these, their pizzas, um, you know, for the home cook. And like the, the, the concept being that you can make these kinds of pizzas at home using these recipes and these ideas. So it's not going to be the exact pizza. It's going to be a way to get in the ballpark with these pizzas. And um, and then you can tweak them. And, and that's one of the goals of all of the, the pizza books that I've written is to give people sort of a starting place, get you in the ballpark. And then let you go ahead and innovate and be creative because that's how a lot of the great pizzas are made. Here's an example of a Sicilian style pizza, you know, with some, you know, wonderful toppings. These, this is becoming uh, this style, square pizzas, number one, but also pizzas that have a lot of embellishment on top after they come out of the oven are is one of the big trends in the world of pizza. It's somewhat, some people call it a Roman style uh, other people, again, when we talk about these different styles, Roman style, Detroit style, uh, uh, California style, Neapolitan stuff, these are terms that have been given to them by other people. You know, we've, and, and if they have traction, they, you know, we get to use that as a way to get in, get in, get our mind around it. But really, in the end, bottom line, they're all pizzas. And so the way I define pizza is essentially um, dough with something on it. That's all pizzas is dough with something on it. And what you put on it is not limited to the pizzas we grew up with. It's not limited to Italian ingredients. It's there's no limit. Pizzas are the dough itself is the key. It's the platform. It's the base. Uh, one of my 10 commandments of pizza, which we'll get to in a second, is that that a great pizza has to have a great crust. And after that, it's all bonus. Everything on top is a bonus. And what you put on top, uh, and that's where. The, the world of what I'll say chef driven pizzas, meaning that that about 15 years ago, a lot of chefs started putting pizzas on their recipe in their on their menus. Uh, and they weren't really focused so much on the on the dough because it, they thought it would be pretty easy to make, but on creative topics. But what they didn't do was put enough attention into having a great crust. Uh, meanwhile, the pizzeria guys were very influenced by the artists and bread movement and began using a lot of the techniques that they were learning from the artisan bread movement, like pre-ferments and long fermentations and things like that, and improving the quality of their pizza crust. So as the pizza crusts improved, it really hardly mattered what they put on top because the pizzas were getting better and better. But then the two worlds came together and these creative toppings, such as this one, I think this one is a 
if I'm not mistaken, uh, this is a, a smoked salmon, kind of a lox and bagel pizza, smoked salmon with a creme fraiche uh, and some pickled, pickled uh, cucumbers. So getting very creative on the top, but my feeling is, is that if you, if you put a lot of energy in the top, but you don't have a great crust, at best, all you will have is an interesting pizza. You will not necessarily have a memorable or, and I say a great pizza has to be memorable. And so the key is to get both a, a great toppings and a great and memorable crust. And then you have a pizza that people can't get out of their head and they'll obsess over it and they'll go back to your pizzeria. So I, I kind of consolidated all this into some commandments. I call them, they're just my own, you know, sort of way of framing it. And, uh, and uh, I'll just quickly go through them. I don't want to get hung up in this section, but there are only two kinds of pizza, good and very good. And by very good, I mean great. And by great, I mean memorable. Memorableness means you can't stop thinking about it. Can't wait to get back. Can't wait to take your friends. This is the determination of greatness. And then I go on with some others. There's no such thing as the perfect pizza. There are only perfect pizzas. And I thank uh, Malcolm Gladwell and... Uh, uh, Howard Moskowitz, who Malcolm spoke about in one of his TED Talks, for kind of bringing out that notion of that there's no one perfect platonic, you know, food thing. There's no, in his case, in, the, in his talk, if you, if you haven't seen it, go to Malcolm Gladwell at, at TED and go to his talk on uh, spaghetti sauce. And he talks about how, um, how uh, uh, one of the pizza, one of the spaghetti sauce companies uh, leaped over ragu. Uh, Prego leaped over ragu by recognizing that there wasn't only one spaghetti sauce. Everybody loves spaghetti sauce, but what they realized is there could be as many as 40 different kinds of spaghetti sauces. And if you can recognize that that there are a lot of people with a lot of opinions, you know, there's the opportunity to reach more people. And I think that that's true with pizza, that there's no one perfect style, no one perfect, but there is execution in all these styles. And that's, I think, you know, part of this quest of making you making them better and better. Um, I'm not going to hover too long on this. You can, um, if you'd like to, um, you know, you can easily uh, bring this up on uh, on uh, Amazon and get these pages for free or get the book even better. Uh, but I'm going to work my way down to um, um, uh, item nine, which it could, with all these, there's a lot of pizza rules that people think about, but the only pizza rule that matters is the flavor rule. And that is flavor rules. So when I get emails from people saying, you know, can I do this? Or is it okay if I try this on my pizza? I've never seen it done before. I just always say default to the flavor rule. Don't worry about it if no one's ever done it before. How does it taste? That's the question. How does it taste? Because what pizza is and what makes pizza the most popular food in the world is that when you have a great crust, which is kind of the delivery system with mm -hmm. toppings on it. So you're really what you're delivering on that delivery system is flavor. And so pizza is the perfect flavor delivery system because the platform, if the, especially if the platform is a great crust, you know, always delivers flavor. After that, it's all about balance and, you know, using your skills to come up with the, the right balance of flavors. Um, and then there's no rules. Then the only rule that matters is, is does it deliver? Let me see if there's any other thing I want to call out. Um, there's some other things here. Um, uh, Okay, number four, great pizza always starts with a great crust. An average crust with great toppings can never be more than interesting, while a great crust with barely any toppings can still be a great pizza. And we know this because we've made focaccias with just olive oil and a little salt on it, and it becomes, again, so memorable that people can't stop thinking about them. And every time they see me, you know, they've either tried it and made it at home, or they, they want to know if, if they're coming to one of my other public classes, you know, are we going to make that focaccia again? So the, anyway, the book goes on and on through, uh, you know, the techniques for how to make doughs. There's a number of different dough recipes. Uh, there's the classic white dough. There's a wet rustic dough that's used for pan style pizzas baked in the square pans or round pans. There is a uh, 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 whole grain dough and also sourdough pizza. And that's the other big trend that I'll just mention briefly is that as you're going to see, a couple trends are going to appear in these photos. Here's one trend. This is the, in the square pizzas, the Detroit style pizzas. One of the things that people are obsessing over is how do you get the cheese that's on the outside of the pizza to climb up the pan and create this lacy, 
Frico or crispy cheese crust around the outside. And there's a, a guy out in, uh, in LA who's also a great photographer as well as a great pizza maker. And he is, uh, in fact, this pizza is uh, the cover shot of the book. And he's become famous on Instagram for making what he calls crown pizzas. Justin De Leon is his name. And um, these crown pizzas, he's figured out a, a way to put cheese around the outside rim of the pan and have it climb up the pan and create these beautiful crowns when they, when they come out of the pan. So that's kind of a trend is uh, the, the getting a, a, it's kind of like for bread makers. They, everyone wants to make a baguette with the ears that kind of separate and that you can grab by your hand. Um, making a frico that is this beautiful is one of those things that's uh, become a holy grail of pan style pizzas. Um, so, but the, but I was saying the trend, uh, the big trend is sourdough and that's not going away. We've seen that in the bread symposium. We've seen it, um, uh, you know, as pizzerias around the country are all starting to learn how to modify their regular classic pizza doughs into sourdoughs, people are wanting it. And there's a lot of good reasons for that. And one of which is that it's better for you. Sourdough is more digestible when it's, you know, when it's made right. But in the bottom line of all these things, it delivers even more flavor. Sourdough is a more complex flavor profile and it and it's fun and it's sort of the next frontier for pizza as it already has been for years for the bread makers. I think this is a stromboli that's in the book. One of the recipes is for a rolled pizza, a stromboli, which is one of my favorite recipes in the book because the photo just is spectacular. Um, we're just gonna keep scrolling through. These are some technique shots. Um, and I'm sure that a lot of you already are pizza makers at home, or maybe even professionally. Some of you may not have done any pizzas, but um, the idea of the book is, is that it will work for both experienced, skilled people, but also for people who have been, um, you know, sort of holding back and are concerned about uh, not knowing how to do it. And so it makes it very user friendly. There's uh, a little chart here for, let's see, what is this one? Uh, oh, it divides the, all the pizzas in the book by the category and style of pizza that it is. Again, you can see this shot here. This is again one of those Frico shots. Frico, F-R-I-C-O, the the crust on the outside, uh, you know, kind of crisping up, almost like a cheese cracker, uh, and forms around the edge. And that's one of the things that's made the Detroit style pizzas one of the hot sort of go-tos of today. If you talk about what's the next thing in pizza, five years ago it was Detroit style. Uh, two years ago it started to move towards Roman style. And all these are just variations. They're all just pizzas. Um, and the next big question is, what's that? What's after that? Is there anything left? And I think, uh, of course, sourdough is going to continue to grow. That can that can encompass any of the styles of pizza. Um, but in terms of shape and things, I think we're going to be seeing more some Asian style pizzas. Japan is is killing it out with pizza out there. They're coming up with all sorts of cool stuff that are then because of the instant you know transmission of information through social media, American pizza makers are starting to adopt ideas of theirs, just like they've been borrowing ideas from us. But here's your sourdough pizza um, in here for those who want to try that. And also there's going to be uh, a lot of information. I'm going to scroll quickly, how to make sourdough from scratch for those who don't have a sourdough starter. And then I want to quickly, before I run out of time, show you some pizzas. Oh, there's a recipe in here called hoagie spread. I call it the secret sauce. The secret sauce is one of those things that makes everything taste better. I had this recipe in my previous book and uh, and every pizzeria that I'm consulting for, including the group here in Cincinnati, where we we have them make this secret sauce, which is basically like a, a relish made from pickled cherry peppers and pepperoncinis and jalapeno and all sorts of things, garlic. And it makes like a relish and you put it on the top of any pizza or almost any style pizza uh, or any sandwich. And it just makes all the flavors pop. For those of you who are familiar with uh, with uh, Samra Nosert's book on uh, salt, what is it? Salt, salt, acid, uh, heat, and fat. Uh, I probably didn't put them in order. You know that acid is so critical, and those those pepper sauces um, are are the acid that helps make flavors pop. Here's a cool pick uh, pizza from Brooklyn from um, um, a guy named um, Nino Coniglio, who is uh, is, is a rising star. He's already a superstar in the pizza world. For those who are into the pizza world, um, he's won all sorts of international competitions. And he has a wonderful a pizza that he gave us for the book with a, it's a white pizza with, uh, let me get scrolled down a little bit. He calls it the ultimate white pie with a garlic confit. So a lot of garlic, fresh tomatoes. You can see, again, 
the beauty. He's got using little small pepperoni, we call them cupping pepperoni. That's another big trend. Make sure that they have pepperoni, the cup when it bakes. This, this pizza has gotten a lot of interest. The Clams Casino Pizza. Basically, it's clams and bacon created by uh, uh, Brian Spangler of a pizza Shoals. And he actually created this pizza for um, uh, Anthony Bourdain when Bourdain featured him in one of his, uh, I think, uh, No Reservations or one of the shows back about 10 years ago. Uh, and that's kind of what it looks like. It's a beautiful pizza. Um, and it just opens up. The shells open up when you bake it. The juices spill into the pizza. Uh, the bacon, of course, makes everything taste better. And it's got a little zing. So these are just, again, the idea is just give you ideas and let your mind just sort of run with it. In Chicago, there's a great pizzeria. Um, called Spacco Napoli. It's Neapolitan style wood fire. Uh, this is one that he doesn't make at the restaurant. He made it for a special occasion, but he shared it for the book. It's got a little bit of whole grain in the dough and he's got some, you know, unusual ingredients that you don't normally see in, in Naples, where which is his sort of go-to area. Uh, something that he applied. Uh, I think he's even, you know, that looks like some fresh beets, all sorts of cool stuff on there. Uh, this was another thing that showed up a lot in the book, corn. I think because when I put out the call for recipes, it was summertime. So everybody was baking with corn. And we got three recipes in the book that all uh, use uh, corn. It doesn't have to be summer corn. It can be frozen corn niblets. But th these places like to do it seasonally. So they only do these corn pizzas in the in the summer. This particular one uses smoked cheese and a little chili pepper. Now, uh, By the way, this one came from Dan Richard, who's probably right now the hottest pizza maker in the country. Um, his uh, his pizzeria is in Jersey City. And an article came out about a year, and he has a new cookbook out called uh, "The Joy of Pizza." Uh, I think this when when the New York Times wrote about him, I think the headline was "The best pizza, the best New York pizza is not made in New York; it's made in New Jersey." And his pizza pizzeria is called Raza. And so Dan is becoming, you know, he's like the, what I call the Chris Bianco of this this time. And Chris Bianco was the poster boy of the pizza uh, artisan pizza movement about 20 years ago. Another corn pizza. Well, here's his corn pizza with the with the uh, uh, smoked cheese. But then there's a couple others. This is a corn and shiitake pie. And this is in a pizzeria in Martha's Vineyard um, developed by uh, Nina May Levin. And she has like a mobile pizza oven in Martha's Vineyard uh, during this during this season. She has lines out the door, or, you know, around the, around the block. And this pizza, I was told by two other well-known people who live on the island, who are food people like uh, um, uh, Ed Levine being one of them, who's the founder of uh, Serious Eats, to, uh, to 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 get with her and get this pizza in the book. So this was one of those when she's making it, people go crazy over it. Paulie G's in Brooklyn is a, a very uh, you know influential pizzeria. It's only about fifteen years old, but it's it's uh, it's had a huge impact. And this is one that. Um, uh, came out of the Pauly G's tree, so to speak, the lineage of pizza makers who worked there and then went on and did other things. This is a, a pepperoni style pizza with hot honey. And Mike's hot honey is, uh, is, the, is the secret ingredient. And, and hot honey is another trend. And many of you are probably seeing hot honey showing up on menus everywhere. Um, this uh, and, and Mike, who gave us the recipe, uh, worked for Pauly G, introduced the hot honey to Pauly G, Pauly G uh, insisted that they put it on the menu and then it suddenly became a business of its own. And now Mike's Hot Honey is a global brand that is selling everywhere and pizzerias around the country are using it or they're making their own hot honey because it's not that hard to make. But, you know, when you can get Mike's, uh, they, they do. And it all started in one pizzeria. And this is this is the pizza that he started it with. Now, oh, this is it here. This is the actual Hellboy. This is a slice. He has a slice shop around the corner from his other pizzeria, Paul E.G. And so they did it there. And there's that hot honey glistening. Um, there's one here that's just onions only. Surprisingly good. They call it the hot onion. But it's lots of sliced onions on there uh, with a few other ingredients, but very simple. Uh, again, finished off with Mike's hot honey. Uh, it's amazing what the contrast of flavors of sweet and, and savory can do for your flavor palette. Uh, and that's again, a trend that's been coming, but it's being applied in the pizza world uh, in new ways. Um, Pauly G himself has submitted a recipe, this one, the Monte Cristo, which is about the simplest recipe in the book. 
It's a Monte Cristo. It's basically slices of Canadian bacon over melted Gruyere cheese finished off with maple syrup. And the maple syrup works like the hot honey. It provides sweetness and a contrast of flavors that, that make everything else pop. So with just those three ingredients, you've got a pizza that once you taste it, you can, again, you start to obsess over it. It's that good and you can't wait to have it again. Here's a, a, one of the sourdough pizza that kind of started the big trend in the uh, for sourdough and other pizzerias because this guy in Washington state, um, Will Grant won an international pizza competition with a sourdough crust and a, a, a blue cheese. That's that. That's the that's the uh, the picture is of the Monte Cristo. The sourdough the sourdough crust is this one, and it's got blue cheese, gorgonzola, a gorgonzola cream uh, on a sourdough crust. Again, contrasting flavors is the key takeaway here. Here's that lox and cheese, lox and cream cheese pizza I was telling you about earlier. I think we have a small picture of that coming up. Yeah, close up of kind of how fun that can be. And it gives, and, and the cool thing about this one is instead of using olive oil in the dough, which most pizza doughs have either some oil or none, he uses chicken fat, chicken schmaltz. And that's because it goes with the theme of the lox and bagel. Is it, does it add a lot of difference in flavor? Not really. It, it, it's functional more than it is flavor wise, but it, it kind of connects you in a, in a different way to this pizza. So it was a fun one to develop. More corn, summer peaches and corn. And this is Sarah Minnick in Portland, Oregon, who was, was cited by the New York Times as having one of the three most important pizzerias in the country right now. It's called Lovely's 50-50. Lovely's 50-50 means that she made, she, her business is 50% pizza and 50% homemade ice cream. And again, um, she runs out of product, you know, halfway through the day. It's that popular. But um, during the summer and only during the summer, she makes a corn and uh, peach pizza. One more, uh, well, this one is uh, peach and more peaches then. So it's summertime. This is Tony Gemignani, probably the most well-known pizza maker in America out of San Francisco, but pizzerias at other places. Um, international award winner, his, his margarita pizza is the first American margarita to beat the Italians at the world championships. So Tony is kind of legendary in the pizza world. And this is one he developed specifically for a competition that he was in years ago. And he shared it in the book. There's a really nice story that he tells uh, or I tell it for him in the, in the uh, opening. I think I'm getting close to running out of time here. So I'm going to just wrap this up and then take questions. Pistachio pesto. So pesto is usually made with pine nuts or walnuts. This one uses pistachio, just a little change like that as a distinctiveness. It has some nice, uh, you know, buff buffalo mozzarella on there. Um, color contrast is like flavor contrast. It really helps make things pop. Here's a, a, a Jamaican style pizza with jerk chicken by a, a woman out of uh, Queens, New York, named Nicole Russell, who's becoming again a rock star. She's got now podcasts. She's started making pizzas in her kitchen just to get through the pandemic, and uh, and become got discovered and got uh, taken to Italy uh, and, and joined the American pizza team. And her career was launched, and she's doing some great stuff. So this is a really cool idea, Jamaican jerk. This is Anthony Mangieri, whose pizzeria was just voted by a different, there's all these different guides and, you know, awards. Uh, his pizzeria, Una Pizza Napolitana, voted the number one pizzeria in the world. It's in, uh, now in New York. It, it was in, it was for a long time originally in uh, Greenwich Village. Then he came to San Francisco and he moved back to New York and he's now on the Lower East Side. Um, the Conchetta is one of his, and he does simple concepts. He was one of the early guys to use sourdough only crust, uh, but it, nobody really picked up on it. Back then, it was like he was the only one. And then Will Grant came along, and then um, uh, uh, Raza Pizzeria in in, uh, in New Jersey started doing it. Sourdough pizza, really, it's going to be, I think, if anyone opens a new pizzeria, if they're not doing sourdough, it's going to be like, you know, you're, you're getting left behind. But this, but uh, Anthony Mangieri is, he's the guy who really has made a mark. He used to be called, he was known when he first opened years ago when he would only make five pizzas and you couldn't ask for any substitutes or anything when you went into his place or he'd throw you out. So he became known as the pizza Nazi, which he was, he wasn't thrilled with that, but you know, that was the days of uh, Seinfeld. And so, um, but nowadays, you know, he's a beloved figure in the pizza world. Here's one that's finished off with potato chips. Uh, it's a, it's basically a BLT pizza with potato chips for crunch. 
that's a guy in Charlotte and, uh, and actually the ranch dressing and here's my wife's recipe. Um, and there's a, what it looks like. It's kind of a uh, ranch and BLTs are a very popular flavor combination. Bar pizzas are another big trend right now. Some of you know this already, if you're tracking any of this bar pizzas have been around forever, ever since uh, Shakey's Shakey's pizza, what was it called? pizza parlor. They did what now we call bar pizzas, thin crusted pizzas that can be made in any kind of oven. All right. I think I'm going to, I can keep going on and on, but I think what I need to do, here's one, by the way, low country, this, this is a low country boil, you know, sausage, corn, uh, shrimp, all sorts of on top of a pizza. So anything that you can think of that works by as a standalone could also be turned into a pizza. Uh, by the way, the, the maker of that, his name's Chris Reiner, same last name as me. He's actually my nephew and he's working in a, a pizzeria in Charlotte and developed this. And I was so proud of him for creating this because it was so good that we put it in the book. Um, and then we get into a whole section on square pizzas, on Sicilians, Detroit style, uh, specialty pizzas. Um, uh, there's that crown pizza I was telling you about. That's the cover shot. That's the cover shot right there. It's a big blob of, I think it's a ricotta or a burrata cheese on top with that beautiful frico crown around the outside with some cherry tomatoes. That that's oh we've got to get this little thing out of here. That is uh, the the photo itself was so striking that we had to make it the cover. Another award winning pizza, another square pizza uh, with a bacon jam similar to bacon uh, you know just bacon or bacon marmalade. This is a uh, uh, you know again flavor combination that um, uh, bacon on you know bacon's on everything these days. But you notice how how much emphasis is put on the top. And you can do that, especially with the square pizza. So a lot of ingredients go on after the pizza comes out of the oven. So it's finished off afterwards. And that's, again, a big trend in the pizza world. Then there's many others. Uh, just going to see if there's any, before I close this down, more uh, chicken bacon ranch style, but in a Detroit pizza. See how pretty that works as a presentation. Um, a, a Sicilian pizza with brajol, lemons and capers. Um focaccias and the Roman pizzas. Uh, here's that Chicago stuffed pizza. It's not a new idea, but I love this photo. It shows what we call the cheese pull. As you, and that, that's sort of what this style is known for. It's so loaded with mozzarella cheese. When you pull a slice off, the cheese just pulls for forever. And so he captured that shot. And all these photos were taken by the makers of the pizzas themselves. I didn't make them and shoot them. They sent me these photos. Here's a wonderful calzone, a deep fried calzone. Again, easy to make. Frying is the innovation, although you know not a new idea. But what's nice about it is when you cut it, you get this. You get this molten filling that just comes pouring out. And uh, the photo alone is, you know, for me, uh, as 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 much fun as the as the calzone itself. Here's another Tony Gemignani pizza baked in a in a cast iron pan. It's a great crust. Uh, that's a, another technique. Tart flambe, classic, um, uh, also known as flamacucha. We have two versions of this from two different pizza makers. Um, it's an Alsatian pizza. Thin, it can be on a thin or thick crust. Uh, it's basically onions and either bacon or pancetta. Um, two ways of doing it. Uh, focaccia slab. This is made with sprouted grain. That's another trend to look through. I've been you know, touting sprouted grains for a long time. Beautiful crust. Look at that open focaccia crust there. And then a double crusted Roman style. So we've got a, a focaccia or uh, a, you know, a thin crusted Roman style on top of another thin crusted with fillings in between. And another pan pizza. Uh, poached pears. Uh, schiacciata is just another variation of focaccia. Uh, so this is more of a, you know, it's a blue cheese and pears, uh, fruits and things like that are great to use in pizzas. And it can be not just for, for front of that, you know, front of the menu, but it can be also desserts. And here's my, one of my favorites is that Stromboli, another shot where you roll it up like a, kind of like a rolled up pizza or a hoagie. It's like a hoagie rolled up and then baked like a pizza. And when you cut it, there's that cheese pull and that stuff just oozes out. And I have to say, and this guy who developed, there's a lot of Strombolis in the world. This is one of the best versions I've ever seen. And one final recipe, we kind of deconstructed a pizza. This is one of my Pizza Quest partners. He came up with this idea where you throw the dough into a wood-fired oven and just cook it separately and then make all these other pizza toppings and then construct your pizza after 
it all comes together at the table. So there's the other thing, the uh, the idea. And here is the epilogue, one one word on the epilogue or one line on the epilogue, which is simply, it's more about the quest than it is about the pizza and the quest never ends. And with that, I'm going to end my share, come back to the, and I'll take any questions. So uh, let me see, I've got to stop the share. And here I'm back. And if anybody has, um, wants to jump into the conversation, um, we'll let uh, Liza and her team uh, sort of moderate that. And uh, either you can, you can either um, raise your hand and we can, we can spotlight you or, um, and I see uh, Victoria wrote, do we need to use double zero flour for the best flavor in our crust? No, double zero flour is only for certain kinds of pizzas. A lot of my pizza, my pizza dose in the book are primarily built with American flour, such as King Arthur bread flour or any other brand of bread flour. But double zero flour is an Italian version. It's a highly sifted, finely sifted, uh, pure flour, it has wonderful flavor, but it's especially designed to, to be used in uh, Neapolitan, wood-fired Neapolitan pizzas. It's it's really that's what it what it was came to America with the whole um, Neapolitan movement, and now the flour is available on a widespread basis. But I wouldn't make every pizza on that flour, and 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 no pizza will be bad no matter which brand of flour you use. But some are more suited just to uh, certain styles of pizza than others. And for some, I, I like to use the highest gluten flour I can get because I want it to really be able to stretch in the oven. Okay, I see some chat questions are coming in. Should I just, uh, Eliza, should I, can I just take these, knock these off, or do you want to uh, recognize people? Go right ahead. You can answer away. Okay, so Eric says, what are workarounds if you don't have a pizza oven and your safest, highest temperature is 500 to 550? Well, all the pizzas in this book are designed for home ovens, not for wood fire. We don't assume that everybody has wood fire, although more and more people are getting them, especially now that uh, unis and rock boxes are so available at a low price. You can do high temperature pizzas, but these were designed to be baked somewhere around 500 degrees. So actually, uh, there's no, no real work around. The pizzas are really designed there. It's just more time. It takes longer. Um, but um, uh, it, for some pizzas, the, the Neapolitan style pizzas, the best trick is to use the hottest setting you can get in your oven. Use a, a pizza stone or a pizza steel and use convection if you can, because the faster it bakes, the hotter it will get, you know, the hotter the oven will get with the convection and the faster it bakes for that style, the better. But for thicker style pizzas, you know, it can be anywhere from five to 18 minutes, depending on the style. Uh, let's see, Paul, uh, are you baking mostly in a kitchen oven or a backyard? Yeah, most these are all designed for kitchen ovens. All these can be used in a backyard pizza oven, even the gas ones, uh, but they were designed because we figure you know, a much higher percentage of the readers are not going to have those tools and they want to be able to just make it at home and they want to have pizza parties for their kids and things. So yes, they're all designed to be baked in a home oven. I have a wood burning oven, says uh, Roxanne. Uh, any helpful hints or tricks? Uh, well, I, it'd be, that could take a lot of time. I would just say, you know, if you know how to drive your oven, if you know how to use it, uh, the trick is again to have the oven set at a temperature that's appropriate for the style of pizza you're making. If you're making focaccia, for instance, which is thick or Sicilian style, you don't want to bake at 800 degrees like you would for a neat Naples style Neapolitan pizza. Uh, you want to bake more at about 600 degrees. You want to be able to slow things down because it takes longer for the dough to get cooked all the way through. But it's really about practice. And I would recommend another Johnson & Wales a, a faculty member has written the definitive book on wood fire cooking, uh, Richard Miskovich, who teaches at the Providence campus. Um, has written the book called From the Wood-Fired Oven. So I commend you to that uh, book uh, about, you know, learning how to use the wood-fired oven for pretty much anything. But uh, I, I would I would uh, default to him for that. Um, let's see. Anne, hi. Hi, Chris. Chef, are you familiar with any pieces made with laminated dough? Ah, that's a good question. For years, I've been trying to duplicate a pizza dough made by a Sicilian family uh, who own a DC area pizzeria that closed decades ago. Thanks. I've had pizzas baked on puff pastry. I've had pizzas baked on uh, croissant doughs. All those doughs can be used. And again, it's tricky because they're loaded with fat, either butter or, or shortening. So you got to know how to use them. But yes, um, there's no reason why you can't use sheets of 
whether it's puff pastry or other kinds of laminated doughs to make pizzas. Um, uh, just make sure that uh, you're, you bake hot. You want that dough to set to trap that fat and butter into the dough and not have it spill out into, you know, into your oven. Uh, but yeah, uh, there's no reason why you can't. Um, it might take some practice though. Uh, I didn't include any of that in this book because it's a little bit of a specialty, uh, but I would play with it. And of course, um, what's his name? Uh, is it Dominic Ansel, the, uh, the guy who created the, uh, um, the fried croissant, what's it called? The, uh, uh, no, I just blanked out on what he calls this fried croissant, um, cronuts, the cronuts. He's just opened a bakery, a full-scale bakery in Las Vegas at the uh, Caesars Palace. I just got the, the article yesterday in Bakery Magazine. Um, and he's doing phenomenally creative things with all kinds of doughs and with a lot of laminated doughs. So, of course, he can you can fry pizza dough and you can fry, you know, laminated dough, which is kind of what's the breakthrough. Uh, so have fun with that. Uh, which is better, a pizza steel or a pizza stone? Good question. They both work really well. They're, they're masses. They are um, basically, they're thermal masses that conduct heat into the bottom of your pizza and they hold heat in your oven. The pizza steel is a relatively new invention. It's made by a guy from Massachusetts um, called the, uh, it's, it's, well, the pizza steel. And just look up pizza steel. He's got a, 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 com a company that he, that spun off of his family's steel fabrication business. And it works great. I've got a couple of them. They bake hotter than a pizza stone. So it takes a little bit of getting used to. Sometimes you can burn the undercrust of your pizza if you're not if you don't have the right setting. It heats up. It holds the heat forever, uh, and it's indestructible. It's also very heavy, so you know don't drop it on your foot. Uh, it comes in thicker and thinner versions. Um, if you're going to use one, you might want to just leave it in the oven and do it. You know, do everything with it in there. But the pizza stone, it can break if you drop it. Uh, it's a wonderful tool. Uh, both of them take about 45 minutes minimum to heat up. You don't want to use, bake on them until they've really thoroughly heated. Uh, they both work really, really well. If I had to say which is better, if I could only have one, I'd get the steel because it's indestructible and it will last forever. And uh, and it and you can use it for a lot of other things besides pizza. You can bake a steak on there. You can do. He's even got some now that have the the the, the griddle patterns. So you can do all sorts of other things. They have you know different styles. You can flip them over, use the smooth side or the griddle side. Um, steel, the baking steels are, um, I would say, in the last five years have become a very hot commodity. Uh, make a nice gift. They're a little more expensive than pizza stones. They start at around 100 bucks. They come, if you can, get the carrying case. The carrying case is worth the price. It's really nice. You can carry them around. Um, and uh, just look it up. And, um, and I've interviewed... Um, Andres Logsdon is the guy who invented it. Uh, I've interviewed him on Pizza Quest. Pizza Quest is basically a podcast with video podcasts and audio podcasts that where I get to interview a lot of people in the pizza world. And uh, and so I Andres sent me a couple of steals, which was nice. And I got to try him out. And then we interviewed him and he talked all about how he came up with the idea. So if you go to Pizza Quest and then in the search window, put Andres, A-N-D-R-I-S, Logsdon, it'll lead you to those interviews with Andres. And you can learn a lot about the pizzas. And he's also got lots of YouTube videos now and Instagram. When you talk about good practices for freezing dough, would you treat uh, it different? Different? Well, most pizza doughs, I usually, after I mix the dough, I don't wait for it to rise fully. I don't wait for it to, to ferment totally. I'll give it about a 30-minute head start, form them into dough balls, and put them inside Ziploc bags individually. I'll spray the inside of the bag with pan spray so it'll slide out easy. Um, and that way you can pull them out as, you know, as often as you, as many as you need, you don't have to pull a big chunk of dough, which takes a long time to thaw. And then what you do with the frozen dough is you move it the day before you're planning to make pizzas into the refrigerator and just let it slowly thaw out. And the next day when it's thawed, basically you will treat it like a refrigerated dough. All the doughs in the book call for refrigeration. Uh, so it's at that point, you just treat it like any refrigerated dough. And the freezer just allows you to hold on to it for a lot longer. They'll keep in the freezer for anywhere from three to six months if you can keep it from frosting up and stuff like that. I just put them, I, 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 I don't wrap them tight with plastic wrap, which is normally you would do to put a skin. If you put them in a Ziploc bag, it will keep them moist, but it also allows them to expand a little bit because while they're freezing, they're salsa rising. And so you want to make sure that there's room for expansion, but it's very easy. And, and pizza dough and any doughs, really any bread doughs, 
uh, pretty much lend themselves to freezing. They all freeze well, uh, but you don't want to ferment it uh, deeply. You don't want to have a long, you know, sort of an aged dough and then freeze it because you won't, by the time you thaw it, it won't have any, what we call push. It won't have any push left for the final rise. Uh, let's see, a couple more here. Uh, do you prefer a stone or a steel? Okay, we talked about that for the home. Uh, I think, again, uh, either one is great, but if I had my choice, my druthers, I'd go with the steel. But if you have a stone, you don't have to run out and buy a steel. It's not It's not going to dramatically make your pizzas better if you have a steel. It's just that it's, uh, it's really efficient as a heat conductor and it's indestructible. Uh, let's see. I make great oven and high temp pizza uh, oven pizzas. How can how can I get a thin crust, crisp crust consistently? A thin crisp crust. Uh, good question. Thin if crisp is the key. When you want thick crisp, you need to bake it longer at a lower temperature. You don't want to bake it at six hundred degrees necessarily. If, if it's thin, you might be able to get away with it. But typically, maybe five hundred degrees or four fifty, and and bake it longer and slower so that you're driving off moisture to make it crisp. The recipe in the book for the bar pizza came from Adam Kuban. Uh, Adam is is uh, is is a well known internet figure. Uh, he was one of the first editors of uh, Serious Eats and Slice magazine, and and he's a great writer as well as a pizza maker. And he's he's on a on a quest of his own to create the perfect bar pizza or thin crusted you know pizza that you're describing. And there's a recipe for that in the book. Uh, there's a few steps that he's come up with innovative steps to allow you to do that. But uh, so I can't really, you know, sort of give it to you in a nutshell here, except that the steps are there in the book. Okay, are there Japanese pizza makers experimenting with different crusts, such as using rice flour? Yes, rice flour is a really good ingredient. It's not just the Japanese, Italian pizza makers. They're making a type of pizza dough called pinza, which is kind of a soft, fluffy dough that uh, is softened by using rice flour and maybe even some other kinds of flours like soy flour and other flour to soften the dough, to, to, to make it less uh, chewy and to give it kind of a pillow-like uh, texture. So that's another area, you know, of exploration that's going on in the pizza world is, you know, if it's dough with something on it, what the something on it can vary and can be international and cultural, but so can the dough. The, under, the, the crust can also be varied and there's no rule other than the flavor rule. That governs what can work. So, um, so, so the Japanese are some that are some people that are doing innovative things. One, one of the things that I, that I saw years ago is is using a salt, uh, like a uh, the the deck of the oven is made with, uh, or maybe on top of the deck of the oven is a big flat stone made from salt. So they're baking that pizza right on salt instead of on stone. Does it impart any flavor or properties? I, I haven't had it so i don't know but uh every time i you know kind of start looking at what's new in the world of pizza i see lots of references to things that are going on in japan so i would either go to instagram or youtube and just put in keywords like japanese pizza and you'll see a lot of innovative stuff some people are saying that some of the best pizzerias in the world are happening in japan tokyo and, and the outskirts um there's also great pizza happening in south america uh, argentina brazil they have their own pizza cultures. Um, every country is really so on board with pizza right now that they're all sort of creating, if they didn't already have one, uh, creating their their own styles of pizza. Um, so it is truly an international food, influenced, of course, by the Italian model, what we call Neapolitan pizza, which is just from means from Naples. Uh, but there's also Sicilian style, and there's all sorts, you know, all sorts of pizzas that came out of Apocaccia, all these that came out of Italy, but that's really just the inspiration. After that, it's all about imagination. And I think that's what we're seeing, um, uh, you know, in the pizza world is that it's a great platform for your imagination. By the way, I don't know if you noticed, but I've got my Johnson & Wales hat on. I've got all branding today. I've got my Pizza Quest t-shirt. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I feel like one of those NASCAR drivers. I'm starting to to walk around like a, a walking brand, but I don't get paid for any of these things, except the, unless you buy a book, then I might get a royalty. But um, um, that's what we've been working on. I think we're kind of getting close to the end. Any final questions? Uh, anybody want to jump in and ask anything uh, live? I know there's a lot of people on here who I recognize, so I know that not all of you are shy, 
So feel free to uh, raise your hand and um, and we'll we'll uh, highlight you. Anything? Nothing coming. All right. Well, I'm not seeing any more chat questions. If you want to throw, I got time for one more chat question uh, or um, any final comments, any thoughts. Oh, how do you do a multi-day ferment? Uh, well, all the doughs in my book are multi-day and, and basically you may, the, the key to a great pizza dough is giving it a long, slow fermentation. In my opinion, that's one of the things that makes it, takes it from being good to great is long fermentation brings out flavors and subtle nuances that are not coming out if you just make the dough on the same day, well, unless you start early in the morning and let it go all day and use it at night. But normally the overnight refrigerator is our friend and uh, because it slows fermentation down and it allows enzymes to work while the dough is kind of going to sleep. Uh, so you get some fermentation flavor, but you get enzyme activity that releases the natural sugars in the flour. And that's where the flavor is. The complexity of flavor is the glucose, the dextrose, the, the maltose, the, uh, the sucrose, all those sugars that are trapped in the starch molecules break out through enzyme activity and release. And then they become available to us for, for our palate. We taste the sweetness of those when, and, and to the oven for caramelization. So the sugars will caramelize where starches won't caramelize. And then um, they also become, uh, you know, part of the, uh, uh, the flavor profile in general, they, they're more complex. So long for So how long is the right of long? You can get tremendous flavor improvement just by giving a 12 to overnight fermentation and then using it the next day. Can you hold it longer? Yes. You could hold the pizzas, the pizza doughs in the fridge, probably for up to five days if you keep it in the refrigerator. Um, uh, and I would suggest um, just keep it in a bowl or a container bulk, then divide it two hours, two to two and a half hours before you're going to make the pizzas, divide them into the dough balls and let them slowly wake up at room temperature covered. Uh, the instructions are, you know, obviously in the book, but um, if you just want to go for it and just give them at least two to two and a half hours to wake up and to begin to swell. And they'll also relax. The dough will relax enough so you can spread it out. Um, and then if you want to keep them longer than, than two days, you, you can do it. If you're going to keep them longer than, let's say, five days, once you recognize that you're not going to use it within five days, put them in the freezer and, uh, and hold them and pull them out, you know, for a rainy day. Let me see if there's any other questions. Um, and, and, uh, of course, whether you're using sourdough or just a yeasted dough, commercial yeasted dough, uh, the multi-day, the overnight fermentation does, is a, is a guaranteed, it's the first thing when people ask me, what's the first, what are a couple of things I can do to immediately improve my dough? So you always make it at least one day ahead and, uh, and then, uh, you can keep it for a few days. Can, can you, you make the dough oh. without yeast and still get a rise? Uh, well, that laminated concept comes in. You can make like a puff pastry will puff up and rise in its own right um, without yeast. Well, when you say yeast, if you mean commercial yeast, yes, you can do it with sourdough starter, but which is still yeast. It's just natural wild yeast. But uh, without yeast, there, there's probably in theory, you could use baking powder. You can use, you know, you can make other kinds of leavening. But I think that it's the yeast and the fermentation that creates the flavor that makes part of what makes pizzas so popular. What are some of your favorite pizza toppings you like to eat? What style of pizza do you like best to eat? <laughs> That's a, that depends on day to, from day to day. Um, uh, my wife always insists on a margarita pizza first. Whenever we go in here, she says, it's kind of like, if you go to a Mexican restaurant, you want to taste their salsa. If you don't like the salsa, let's get up and leave. And if they can't make a great margarita pizza, then let's not waste our time trying all their fancy pizzas. Um, but I have one that I'm, you know, one of my favorite uh, go-tos is a focaccia, and it can be also done as a pizza with a blue cheese, walnuts or pecans, and a um, caramelized balsamic onion marmalade. Uh, and I've had that recipe in almost all of my, at least my last four or five books, I have a variation of that recipe. The flavor combination of a blue cheese, the sweet and savory notions of the onions, and then the walnuts, the flavors work in really uh, harmonious ways to create a, a, a very uh, memorable or addictive, you know, flavor. Whenever I have a, a pizza class, I usually make that one for the class because people who 
usually shy away from blue cheese, we can win them over with this one. They Once they say, wow, you know, I didn't realize blue cheese can work in some other combination in a way that I'll like it, then I consider that a victory. So that's one of my favorites. I think we probably should stop here, though. Um, um, Peter, uh, we do have one. Yeah. We have one hand raised, Paul. Wait. If you wanted to turn on your mic and ask your question, okay, Paul. Sure. Hey, Peter. I could, couldn't let the whole thing go without somebody asking a question. Thank so you. <clears throat> I've been starting to poke around with uh, home milling. Yeah. You know, right, right from the from the grain. Do you have any guidelines or or gotchas for home milled flour versus store bought, which seems a lot finer. Yeah, well, home milling is a you know, great popular trend. And uh, uh, one of the tricks is that if you make your dough right away after you've milled the flour, you're, you can't beat the flavor of freshly milled grain. And if you're going to use it in its whole form, of course, it's going to be heavier than a white flour. You can also get some fine, you know, like sifting tools uh, and bolting it uh, out some of the bran and germ so that you can make it kind of like a, uh, a high extraction flour or like a, what they call type 85 flour, kind of like what, what Polan uses in his country niches. Um, but um, but flavor-wise, you can't beat fresh milling. And uh, and it's better for you. There's a lot. Of, but then if you're not going to use it, like within, let's say, 24 to 48 hours, then the best thing to do is then put it in a container and then let it sit for about a week and a half to two weeks because the enzymes that are in there are very volatile at that point. And if you try to make bread... Well, in that in sort of the in-between stage from when it's first milled to when the enzymes have settled down, there's a period that we call greening, green flour, where the, the flour is young and it's it's it misbehaves. You know, what can I say? It's like a kid. And and then by about the second week, it settles down and it's mature. Uh, we call it tempered. And then you can use it and it's still fresh flour. Uh, I would keep it uh, again anytime I'm freshly milling anything or using whole grain flour. I keep it in a covered container, either in the refrigerator or the freezer, but make sure it's sealed tight because that, that will slow down any ran, rancid active action from the oils that are in there. But yes, I love, I love the, 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 the growing interest in working with freshly milled. And there are some pizzerias that are milling their own flour right there in, on premises. Most of them are working some of it into their dough. They're not using it hundred percent usually because it's just a heavier pizza and it's, it's a harder sell to the customers. But it's a great movement, and it's, and it's a growing movement in the in the bread and pizza world. So Super. yeah, keep doing Thank it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, I think that takes us up according to my clock. It's one minute to seven, uh, and I think Zoom is going to cut us off at a certain point. Liza, do you want to wrap things up? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Peter, for such an incredible presentation and discussion. I know I'm definitely craving pizza now. I'm sure everyone else is as well. Thank you all in attendance this evening. As you know, JWU provides a truly unique and exceptional education. Tuition alone does not fully cover all that sets Johnson & Wales apart, including the experiential opportunities critical to success in the process of building and navigating a career. Your registration for this event includes a gift to JWU's College of Food Innovation and Technology. Your support helps CFIT continue to provide a truly unique and exceptional education that prepares our students for success. This experience is made possible by the generosity of our loyal donors and gifts of all sizes combined to have an impact on our students that is truly powerful. As an alumni and a donor, your gift also demonstrates your investment in our mission, which can inspire additional support from other members of the JWU community, as well as corporate donors and foundations. If you'd like to make an additional gift, you can click the link in the chat window. Thank you all for your support. Hey, Liza, can I throw yeah. out one more final comment? Absolutely. Before we sign off. Um, if you get a chance, go to my website, uh, pizzaquest.com, or write to me. If you have any follow-up questions, write to me at peter at pizzaquest.com, uh, and I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. Um, uh, and, uh, and yeah, but check out the website and, and w watch some of the videos and, uh, and let me know what you think. And with that said, and, of course, final plug, you can. I think the best price for this book right now is through Amazon. Uh, but uh, you know, you can you can make great pizza without any pizza book. Um, the pizza books are just to give you, just inspire you and to give you um, new ideas for your imagination. Thank you all for being part of this tonight. Thank you, Liza and, and your team. And uh, 
thank all of you for supporting Johnson and Wales University. Have a great night, everyone, and happy holidays. <laughs>